I'm guessing the people you represent, speak for and talk to have a particular perspective on this, not shared by many people. What are they seeing? Well, actually, I think, I think that perspective is shared by a lot of people at the moment. The reality is that um, 20 to 25 percent of our members, uh, London taxi drivers, are not at work because they can't find fuel. And it's, uh, it's the, the, the platitudes and reassurances from the Prime Minister and Grant Chaps that, you know, don't panic, Captain Mannering, all's well. Well, all isn't well because my members can't find fuel and they can't go to work. So be it a made up crisis or an introduced crisis, it's a crisis for people who can't go to work. And if it carries on much longer, it's going to start affecting other assets of uh, life in London and it's going to cause a bigger problem than need be. David Fothergill, it's worth stressing at this stage, and actually since Steve mentioned London, it's worth making the point that this is geographically patchy. I mean, for instance, large parts of Scotland are today pretty much back to normal, so it's certain areas are, are more affected than others. But from a local government perspective, particularly it would appear in the south of England, you've got to think through the potential contingencies, as Steve was indicating there too. There are knock-ons. One thing starts here but then moves on to affect other parts of the economy or society at large. How do you plan for this? So our big concern really is social care and how we deliver to some very vulnerable people, particularly those that rely upon domiciliary care. Um, but equally, there's a lot of other essential workers that we need to consider. Uh, and, it, and it's teaching the teaching staff, keeping those schools open. It's the blue light services to make sure we can get them there and a whole range of other people. So, so there are a lot of essential workers here that we need to keep traveling into work. Um, and the work, the planning has already been done through what's called local resilience forums, LRFs. Um, and those local resilience forums lay out very clear plans of how we should go about identifying petrol stations which supply essential workers, and it also begins to define who those essential workers are. So we've got all that in place. Everything is well laid out, but we can't trigger that ourselves. That has to be triggered by the government, and that's not been triggered uh, at the moment. Um, I guess if it doesn't improve in the next day or so, it will have to be triggered. But at the moment, those plans are just there in the background. Steve, would your members encourage the government to trigger those measures so that key workers can actually access fuel by priority? We've been asking for this since uh, over the weekend. I, I was speaking to Sadiq Khan's team over the weekend who, who run Transport for London. Back in 2000, during the last fuel crisis, there was an emergency order made. I, obviously, your, your other contributor will know better than me, but it's under a 76 Energy Act or something. And what happened, there was... Uh, a prescribed list of essential users. I think there was 10 fuel stations designated originally in London, healthcare workers, blue light workers, taxi drivers are included on that list. And that pretty much stopped the crisis deepening and getting worse. At the moment, the government are totally resisting doing it. I I've been speaking to civil servants today who tell me that there's not a national emergency and they won't be doing it. And, you know, I say to them, well, can you come on the phone and tell my members who can't work? And will you be prepared to tell doctors and nurses at the end of the week who can't get to work? Will it be an emergency then? And they just keep saying, don't worry, all's well, it will all be fine. And of course, it's not. David, I suppose to some degree, government will look back on the early 2000s to the, the fuel shortages then and think, what lessons can we learn? But the problem is, of course, that things move on remarkably quickly. A couple of decades ago, uh, the, the incidence of... Smartphone usage was minimal, now everybody's got one, and people talk on them. So when a delivery arrives at a service station, the word goes out on Facebook or whatever, and people swarm to that particular service station. So any graphs people have got trying to plot human behaviour in this is, are probably obsolete already. It probably is. And I'd also say that we've moved on significantly as a society over the last 10, 15, 20 years. For example, we've moved a lot of the elderly people who were in residential homes to live in their own homes. That's what that's where they need to be. That's where they do best. They live at home. But of course, as soon as they live at home, then we have to give them the support at home. We have to get people there twice a day to do some pretty basic tasks for them. You know, it's not just get them ready for bed and put them to bed. They have to be cleaned and they, you know, they have to have their, their pads changed and everything else. So we have moved as a society to be a lot more decentralised in the services that we provide and provide in home. But to be able to provide those, we've got to get people to those houses. And at the moment, we are struggling, particularly in the rural areas. I'm talking to you from Somerset, uh, and we have some very rural areas. And how do you get those carers up onto Exmoor? How do you get them uh, to, to, to really remote communities to provide those services when there is a shortage of fuel? 
fuel. So, so completely understand the problem. Uh, and I guess we are slightly different to London as Steve, but, you know, it's the same problem that we have. Uh, there are different problems present presenting themselves in the future, though, aren't they? Steve, I'm going to be talking in a moment about how there's a lot more interest, understandably, as you'd imagine right now, in electric vehicles. But actually, if you are where David is in Somerset, where actually you've got inclement weather very often, you've got muddy conditions, people are necessarily using 4x4 vehicles, well, uh, electric 4x4 vehicles, that's, that's not quite a simple proposition. I think the point I'm trying to make, Steve, is that people are looking hard at their future cho choices right now because they're seeing what's happening on the roads and in the forecourts. They're reminded just how important the motor vehicle is to their, to their lives and how potentially vulnerable they are without one. Yeah, I mean, electric vehicles, um, we have adopted London taxis. 25% of our fleet, sorry, 35% of our fleet is now electric. Uh, and it's the 65% that are struggling that can't get fuel. So our adoption of electric vehicles is well documented. Mm -hmm. And had it not been for the pandemic, we would have probably been fully electric by 2024. We've, we've bought into it in a big way and, and bought being the key word. Um, it's interesting when David talks about carers because... One of the calls that we've been receiving and taxi circuits in London have been receiving is from care providers, these companies that provide carers that drive around. And they're saying to us that, you know, our carers can't get fuel. Can you provide a taxi and a driver to drive them around? And of course, we're saying possibly, but possibly not because we haven't got any fuel either. So it really is a double edged sword. Finally, on your point on electric four by fours, it, there's, there's now so many electric vehicles on the market. Um, many of them are 4 by 4s I, I went to a show last week, and you, you just cannot believe how many are coming out and how quickly they are. So I don't, really don't think it'll be a problem, even in rural Somerset. David, I mentioned at the beginning there that Surrey Council was contemplating declaring a major incident. It's a, it's a phrase we hear a lot. Um, how do you trigger it? What does it mean in effect? Well, first of all, can I just reassure your viewers that not everybody in Somerset drives a four by four and lives down a muddy lane. We do, we do have proper roads, and we do, <laughs> we we do have electricity as well, and we have gas, believe it or not, and the internet. But um, just moving to your point, so 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 an emergency is when uh, two organisations that sit within an LRF, um, so it could be a council, it could be the police, it could be fire, or it could be ambulance service. The, two partners believe that the situation has gotten now so grave that it's outside of their control and that they need the support of the other organizations and that's essentially what i think sorry i think i think they're about to do but i'm not sure they've done it yet um in terms of calling a major incident and we did it back in 2014 when we had the floods in somerset um you'll remember we called the major incident there which allows you to bring in extra resources to bring in extra coordination uh, and it's really helpful but of course, the important thing is to actually get the fuel in the petrol stations. That's what we really need, and to make sure that we get it to the right people. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows, and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.